would like to talk about the role of volatility and stability in the global oil market. I believe that if you want to know where you are and where you are going, it helps to spend just a little time recalling where you have been. And so in this chart, I'd like to talk about the history of the modern global oil market. Now, when you say the modern global oil market, you think starting in the Arab oil embargo of 1973. That's when uh, most people begin or start the modern oil market. I say, no, no, no. Let's go to the very, very beginning in the state of Texas, uh, excuse me, Pennsylvania, in the United States in 1859. And so this chart here shows you oil prices going back to the very beginning of the modern oil market, which began in, in, in Pennsylvania. Now these data come from British Petroleum. They are annual average oil prices. And what you see here in these annual data is the oil market has gone through long periods of volatility or really gyrations and then stability. So we have to ask ourselves from the big picture, what contributes to stability in oil prices and what contributes to volatility in oil prices? Now, the modern oil market began in the late 1800s. We were trying to replace whale oil for lighting. Uh, and we learned something from the very beginning about the oil market. And that is the price is prone to wild swings. Naturally, when left ungoverned or unmanaged, the price swings. Why does the price swing? Because oil exhibits what economists call low price elasticity of supply and the demand in the short run. In plain English, that means it, supply does not respond to changes in price very quickly. It takes a long time to invest and bring on new oil supply. And once you have invested in new oil supply and you are producing that oil, you have sunk your capital. You don't turn it off. It's not like a spigot in your sink. So oil is unresponsive on the supply side. It's also un unresponsive on the demand side now that it's become part of transportation. When the price of beef goes up, most people will buy chicken. When the price of gasoline goes up, well, here you have ethanol. But in the rest of the world, the price of gasoline goes up, you still buy gasoline. You have no choice. There are no scalable alternatives for oil and transportation. So demand doesn't respond quickly to price. So supply and demand are inflexible. This means when the market is imbalanced, the price tends to swing. Now, the early producers in the oil market. Mr. Rockefeller, you see his picture right there, he noticed this and said, well, we can't have a serious market that's going to move from replacing whale oil and lighting to going into transportation. Uh, we can't have a world-scale investment in a, for a, in a market where the price exhibits these bust boom or boom bust cycles. And then it was really more bust boom because we were always finding more oil uh, than we could consume. The price would collapse, demand would increase, the price would go up, and we had this bust boom, bust boom cycle. So Mr. Rockefeller comes along and he says, we can't have this. And so he organized and controlled the U.S. and then the global oil market, starting with the pipelines and the refineries and then the upstream. He manipulated supply to bring stability to the price to being, bring stability to investment. And that's, you see, this period right here. Now, we came into the 1900s, and in the United States, we had our progressive era. We didn't like big corporations controlling huge parts of the economy. And so the United States government broke up Standard Oil, and we split them up into many different companies. And there, then, you had no company or group of companies controlling investment and setting prices. And you had this period during the 1920s, and I have a picture of some people doing the swing dance, because I call that the first swing era in oil prices. These data are annual prices, so they don't show you the monthly or weekly gyrations, which if you read the history, were quite, quite volatile. We had this, this wild volatility in oil prices. 
at this point, oil is going into military equipment. Oil is going into the consumer economy. We're building cars. We're building roads. It's going into factories. It's becoming a strategic commodity. So the Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the uh, liberal progressive government officials came in and they said, well, we can't have evil corporate titans controlling the market for oil. But we also can't have this wild volatility in this price for oil. So the United States, with the help of Great Britain and Holland, implemented what I call OPEC version 1.0, the most successful OPEC the world has ever seen. The government allowed oil companies, urged oil companies, to thoroughly organize and control the global oil market. They used every manipulation tool in the book, market share agreements, pricing formulas, and most importantly, and a very important concept, spare production capacity. Remember, oil supply doesn't go up or down quickly in response to price. That is why producers have decided to introduce some flexibility by holding what they call spare production capacity. These are fields that are invested in, that are ready to go, but the supply is held off the market. It is able to come on the market very quickly if they need to offset a disruption or balance the market. So what the Texas Railroad Commission did, Texas Railroad Commission was a government body that set allowable quotas for production in Texas and Louisiana. So Texas Railroad Commission was like OPEC of today. They met every month. They set well uh, limits. And they were very successful. In 1956 and 1967, we had two Arab-Israeli conflicts. Those conflicts triggered the largest disruptions in oil supplies we have seen, <coughs> percentage terms, not volume. The market was smaller then. If you read a history book on oil, the chances are you won't read much about the 1956 disruption or the 1967 disruption. Why? Because Texas had spare production capacity up to and including almost 20% of the market. They just ordered higher supply. So when oil was cut off in the Strait of Hormuz, Texas produced more. The effect on price was very small. In 1973, we had another Arab-Israeli conflict. This one we talk about. Why? Because the year before, in 1972, the Texas Railroad Commission lost its power. It's lost its ability to control the global oil market. There was the monthly meeting in March of 1972, and the commission made a very momentous decision a very unfortunate decision for the United States. The chairman called it a damned historic occasion. He ordered full production in the United States, keeping no production back in spare. Why? Because demand for oil was surging very strongly, and our production was beginning to flatten. That 1972 moment represented a handover of supply to OPEC countries, preliminarily Saudi Arabia. So when the next disruption came along, it wasn't so much that they were able to disrupt our oil. The actual oil disruption was very small. They were able to force price increases onto consuming countries, including the United States, and we had no power left to, to control that. Now, OPEC took over from the United States as the stabilizer of the global oil market by manipulating supply. In my view, they did this successfully until 2008. In 2008, Saudi Arabia, some people say, entirely ran out of supply. I think they did. Maybe they had a little bit left. But in 2008, with oil prices at $143 a barrel, Saudi Arabia had to use all of its spare production capacity. Saudi Arabia is the only country in OPEC that holds significant spare production capacity. And it ran out in peacetime. This is what happened to the United States in 1972. So the question, before I get through the rest of my slides, is will there be an effective OPEC or supplier group that can play the role of these other three in manipulating supply so as to keep prices stable, even at a range that producing countries and consumer countries would find comfortable, 90 to $100? That is the important question.
Oops. Okay. Please bear, bear with me on this complicated slide. I'm sorry, I had to uh, put this together. I think it brings together some of the supply demand fundamentals, spare capacity, price, and geopolitics in a nice way that tells the more recent modern history of the oil market. What we show here, these black bars, are disruptions in global oil supply due to wars or geopolitical risks. And they're expressed in percent of the total oil market. So, Arab oil embargo, Iran revolution, Iran-Iraq war, we have many disruptions over here. All expressed in percent of total oil market demand. The gray area is oil supply that was clearly threatened by an ongoing geopolitical conflict, but not actually disrupted, just threatened. And this here is the tanker war in the Persian Gulf when there were hundreds of, mar of tankers that were hit by missiles, hundreds of mariners being killed. 14 million barrels a day going through the Strait of Hormuz, about 20% of the global oil market. Now this red line is the all-important spare production capacity. The key tool that OPEC, really Saudi Arabia, uses to ensure price stability. Now we have to watch and see what happened here. This blue line on the right axis is the price of oil. So you see in the 1980s was a very turbulent, violent, and disruptive period. Major wars in the beginning and the end, a tanker war in between. The price of oil collapsed. The price of oil collapsed during all this war. Now, why was that? How could we have all this conflict and have the price of oil collapse, not even go higher? I think it has something to do with this red line. Spare production capacity was very high. Why was spare production capacity so high? Spare capacity was high, and in spare capacity, remember, that's like the insurance for the market. That's like the fire patrol. That's the, that's the buffer against instability or disruptions. It was high because Saudi production went very, very low. The last time we saw oil prices so stable as we have in the last few years was in the early 1980s. Um, and this period here was actually quite stable annually. And it was because Saudi Arabia cut its production. It played the swing producer <coughs> role. And as its production went down, the amount between its production and its capacity went higher. There was a lot of room for error. There was a lot of buffer and spare in the market. So this was like the US during 1956. We had 20% of the market in spare. This, the price collapsed because Saudi Arabia became sick and tired of playing the swing producer role. And that's very important for where we are today and where we're going in the future, by the way. The Saudis did not enjoy playing this role. They cut their supply while their competitors were increasing their supply. US, Soviet Union, Mexico, other OPEC countries. Etc. They did not enjoy that. And I think they vowed they will not repeat it. Again, a very important lesson when we talk about where we are today and the future. Now let's look at the 1990s. A day at the Copacabana Beach. Wonderful. Wonderful. No disruptions. Peace. Prices fairly stable. Between $20 and $30 a barrel. Wonderful. Spare capacity. About 5% of the market. There is a rule of thumb among barrel counters, analysts, who say that if, if OPEC can keep about 5% of the market in spare, and geopolitical risks are calm, the price of oil will probably be calm. Traders, investors, market participants will have confidence and faith that OPEC can meet a disruption uh, and is willing to stabilize the price. And that's, that's what you saw right here. We all would like to go back to the 1990s, although at a higher price level. We all would trickle back. The problem is we live in this world right here. And the defining feature of the global oil market, in my view, is low spare production capacity. Very low spare production capacity. And that means low ability of Saudi Arabia or OPEC countries to keep the price stable. That, I think, is the world we're in. We have low spare production capacity and high 
and frequent disruptions and disruption risks. This is a dangerous world. Now you see spare capacity went up here in uh, 2009 to 5%. That is not because Saudi Arabia was playing the swing producer role. That was because of an enormous recession in demand. Demand collapsed. Yes, OPEC countries cut, but they were not managing the market. They were cleaning up after an accident. And you see, as the world began to slowly recover, we're not increasing supply fast enough for OPEC to both supply the market with oil and keep that spare capacity buffer. OPEC is not investing in enough to keep that 4 million barrels a day we need in spare. And so spare capacity came very, very low. I want to say, too, that this red line is based on official Department of Energy data, which are optimistic. Most people in the private sector think the line is much lower. We doubt that Saudi Arabia has as much spare capacity as is reflected in this chart. OK. Um, In my view, when you try to analyze the global oil markets, you often get very focused on one specific issue or one specific region, heavy oil sands, Brazilian offshore, maybe a demand issue. But I often find that for any given five-year period, often we're missing something big. We're missing, in, in the English expression, we're missing the forest for the trees. We're, we're focused on the trees, and we're missing something big. Uh, Ten years ago, the big thing that the analysts were missing was that supply in the world was not going to rise as fast as it did in the 1970s and 1980s. When OPEC countries took over from the United States in 1973 and insisted on high price increases, they triggered a supply response, as I mentioned, Soviet Union, Mexico, North Sea, North Slope. This supply caused them a lot of problems. Now, when the oil prices 10 years ago started to quintuple, many analysts said, aha, there's an expression, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices, because supply will come up and make OPEC stay difficult. And everyone was expecting that. And these are forecasts, every line is a year, of non-OPEC supply growth by the International Energy Agency, the most influential government organization whose forecasts everyone relies on. And what you see is we track their revisions. And what this chart shows you in through 2003, 2004, 2005, as oil prices were rising strongly, they started out expecting a lot of supply. But as time went by, the supply was very small. This is a picture of the community of the world's best oil analysts learning that supply, the supply curve is much steeper than we thought. Or that's, that what we saw in the 70s and 80s was not going to happen. That was our first big surprise. The next big surprise, and I was surprised by this one as well, I think everybody was, was that the US would have a, another oil boom, the shale oil boom. And this shows you forecasts of US production growth whoops, by, the, by the Department of Energy uh, for various years. And here's the most recent one. And you just see how wrong we were. And this has been a a very, uh, a very fortunate supply, uh, surprise uh, for, for analysts, as I'll talk about in a minute. So this was another surprise. Now people say, well, if the US is going to have an oil boom, doesn't that mean that the world will have plenty of oil, and oil prices will stabilize, and everything will be OK? I wish that were the case. It is not, in, in my view. Oil to the United States will grow strongly, but still represents a very small amount of total supply. This chart from the International Energy Agency shows you where the oil supply in the next uh, 30 years, 20 years, is expected to come from. Note this here. This is declines in existing fields. So this is production from fields that are producing today, but that will be in decline. And look how sharply they decline. So we need to bring on new oil from Brazil, from Mexico, from Kazakhstan, from the United States, partly to offset these declines before we can increase one drop for the people in China, India, the southern hemisphere here in the Middle East who want to get into cars. 
The second category here, this is supply that is expected to come from fields we haven't even found yet. And this is supply from fields that, I'm sorry, this is fields that, the, the, the light blue is from fields that we found but has not, have not been developed. This blue is from fields we haven't even found yet. Here is the U.S., light tight oil, a little bit internationally. We need every drop. We need every drop. And the U.S. oil boom has certainly prevented a spike of oil prices back to $140 in the past year, as we'll talk about in a second. That's no question. But will the U.S. oil boom alone ensure that the global oil market has the supply it needs to meet the voracious demand? Absolutely not. Oops. Okay. Okay. I'll just be brief here because in a way it's, my next point is not too relevant to the price collapse recently, but I, I think it's important. In my view, the forest that we're missing right now, the big uh, misunderstood dynamic in the global oil market, is that GDP growth is probably more oil intensive than we would like to think, that our governments would like to believe, and that would be implied by the history of the OECD countries over the last 40 years. In my view, among many government forecasts and leading forecasts, there is an optimism about how quickly biofuels or electricity or natural gas vehicles or fuel economy standards or withdrawal of subsidies, all of these factors which we hope and expect will quickly reduce the amount of oil that's needed to produce a level of GDP, in my view, are optimistic. I think if you look at the leading forecasts, we're assuming that the rest of the world, Asia, Middle East, Latin America, will achieve the same rate of efficiency gains that the OECD did in the last 40 years. I respectfully disagree. In the OECD, there were some very big differences. In the OECD, in Western Europe, Japan, the United States, we were able to take oil that was being used in electricity generation and for power plants uh, and for space heating, and we replaced it with natural gas, nuclear, and others. So we were able to switch oil in a way that is not available in the fast-growing parts of the world today. Secondly, OECD countries tended to remove subsidies, if anything, tax consumption, but remove subsidies. Whereas in the developing part of the world today, you have deeper and stronger subsidies and an aversion uh, to lifting them very quickly. Now, this chart shows you the implied oil intensity in IEA forecasts. And I can go into it in Q&A. Uh, but it basically shows that I believe leading analysts are starting to discover that GDP growth requires more oil than we thought and that we would like to believe. Now, to this point, I'm going to, I will leave this presentation for you online and you can look this up yourselves. But this is a chart from the International Energy Agency, which strongly promotes alternatives to oil. Uh, but it assesses the ability of alternatives to oil to scale up very quickly. And you can see what they basically say is when you compare oil to the alternatives across economic cost, uh, technological feasibility, ability to scale, environmental concerns, oil is far superior to every other alternative. And this is from, again, the IEA. OK, well, so I just told you that Saudi Arabia lost control in 2008. They're not holding enough spare capacity right now. Therefore, oil prices should gyrate. But as Edmar and I were just discussing on TV, we've just experienced one of the longest periods of low volatility in prices in recent years, almost about four years. The last time we saw such a low period of price volatility, as I said, was in the early 1980s because Saudi Arabia was cutting its supply drastically. So why did we have this period of low volatility? I should say the 1980s period, this is the 1980s, uh, it ended, that period ended abruptly when the Saudis decided not to be the swing producer anymore. They flooded the market, crushed the price of oil, extended the economic recovery, and bankrupted the Soviet Union. So. Oops. Why do we have 
um, why did we have this period of low volatility recently? In my view, there are several factors. All of them had to be present. You needed every single one of them. One was, yes, record Saudi production. They were producing over 10 million barrels a day this summer and last summer. That's the highest we've ever seen Saudi Arabia go. So Saudi Arabia was working very hard, harder than we've ever seen, to put all its supply on the market. Now, they say they can produce 12.5 million barrels a day. So if they're producing 10, and they say they can do 12.5, that means there's 2.5 million barrels a day in spare. Again, respectfully, most people in the private sector question whether they could produce 12.5 million barrels a day. It's unknown. But what we do know is that Saudi Arabia was working very, very hard. The second factor was the US uh, supply growth. Again, with all the disruption we've seen from Libya, Yemen, Sudan, uh, Nigeria, almost every barrel that was disrupted was replaced by an unexpected US barrel, 3 million barrels a day over the last several years. So a very happy um, surprise. The third factor is slow GDP growth. If you look at the IMF forecasts going back several years, or look at them now looking ahead several years, the economists are optimistic that the world will grow close to 4% globally, high threes, 4%. Now they keep on postponing that because the world has been growing much more slowly than they expected. But that slow GDP growth has helped keep global demand in check. It's helped depress global demand. And finally, uh, or next to finally, until recently, we were drawing down inventories. We were drawing down inventories in the OECD, and as we watched them, China was slowing its rate of inventory building. So companies were running down their stocks. A final factor not shown here is central banks, mainly the Fed, have been flooding the world with liquidity in the last few years. This has suppressed volatility in all financial assets, equities, bonds, uh, and oil. So there's been a macro factor at work here. I think it's remarkable, though, if you think about it, oil prices still were bumping up against $100, $110, $115 in June. So we had maximum Saudi production, huge U.S. production, slow growth, slow growth, and destocking, and oil prices still were reaching $115. If you were to take away any of those factors, in my view, the price would have gone right up. But we had a happy circumstance. Now, oops. why have oil prices dropped sharply into the low 80s for Brent, high 70s for WTI? Several factors. First, GDP growth outside the United States and oil demand has sharply decelerated this year, especially in the second quarter. Europe is on the brink of a, of a, of a recession, uh, even deflation. China its government doesn't even want to grow too strongly. It is more concerned with rebalancing growth. It is not stimulating in the way it has in the past. We can talk about that in Q&A, but China's not growing strongly. Uh, Japan uh, is raising its consumption tax. Its economy is very weak. So you saw a sharp deceleration in demand for oil. The, uh, the second factor was, um, the, the other one here is, is Libya. So Libya was the largest disruption we've seen in recent years. Libya used to produce one and a half million barrels a day, uh, went down to zero after the revolution, came back up and went down again. They are now in a civil war, but despite that civil war, as you see here, they have been able to increase their production, which is remarkable uh, given the conflict there. So you had the combination of slowing, sharply slowing demand, not just <coughs> mid threes or low threes, probably below three and then Libya coming back, you started to see oversupply develop. Now that is the reason we fell into the $90 range. But you know, we've fallen into the $90 range several times in the last few years. And uh, the smart money was to buy that $90 price or assume it would go higher. But now it hasn't, it's fallen to the early, the low 80s. Why? And this is the most important factor, Saudi Arabia, and OPEC have signaled to the market that they do not intend to cut production to play the swing producer role and keep a floor under prices. 
it is um, it is hard to kind of overstate how much of a shock this is to many market participants. Most market participants, investors, had always believed, as we talked about earlier correctly, that there's some supplier group out there that is working to ensure a price floor. Texas Railroad Commission, Standard Oil, OPEC. And everyone pretty much assumed that below $90 well, below $130, OPEC countries will have revolutions because their budgets won't be balanced and they won't be able to afford the subsidies they need to keep their people uh, docile. And so until about a month ago, people said, well, if this combination of weak GDP growth and Libya return is going to create an oversupply, then Saudi Arabia and OPEC will have to cut. And when the message went out, no, we will not, at that point, I don't want to say panic, but a quick uh, reappraisal of the situation was necessary. So now let's talk a little bit about looking ahead for the next sort of six to twelve months. These, this is a chart from OPEC. Uh, OPEC produces a, a very good monthly report and they forecast uh, the demand for their oil. This is the call on OPEC. And you see how sharply it falls in the first quarter of 2015. It falls by about a million and a half barrels a day. Actually, relative to current production, it falls about 2 million barrels a day. So according to the economists and the energy analysts at OPEC, somebody needs to cut supply by about 2 million barrels a day in the first half of the next year to keep oil prices stable. Now again, until recently, the assumption would be, well, that is what OPEC will do. They're going to have a meeting on November 27th. They will pass around this chart. They will then agree that everyone will contribute equally to cuts, and then Saudi Arabia will do all the cutting. That's how OPEC usually works. But the new signal that came out is um, Saudi Arabia and OPEC uh, don't intend to rush into cuts. I was in Saudi Arabia uh, and, and at UAE in September, and this message was sort of reaffirmed, but it's something we have been analyzing and looking at for quite a while. Um, in the Saudis' view, U.S. shale oil ought to do any first cutting that is necessary. This is not because the Saudis or OPEC want to hurt or bury U.S. oil production. No. I don't think they're threatened by U.S. oil production. When I hear from very senior Saudi officials, they, they say U.S. shale oil has been a blessing, and I think they mean it. It was a blessing, as we just discussed, because it helped put a ceiling on the price of oil in the last few years. But it's also a blessing, they say, because it will help put a floor on the price of oil. Now, why do they think it will put a price on the uh, floor on the price of oil? Here we have to discuss the differences between shale oil and conventional or even unconventional, sort of conventional, unconventional oil. Conventional oil or unconventional deep water or oil sands is very capital intensive up front you're basically sticking a straw into the ground. Now it can be very deep into the ground, but you're sticking, a lot of equipment is needed. You're sticking a straw in the ground and you're letting natural pressure and then some gas and oil down the road to keep that production flowing from the ground. So it's a up and then plateau. Shale oil is very different. Shale oils, instead of a straw in the ground, it's more like wringing a sponge, a sponge that's wet with water. When you frack, uh, a shale reservoir, you crack the rock, you liberate the molecules, the hydrocarbons very quickly, like wringing a sponge. You get a lot of volume very quickly, but then it tails off, it declines very fast. You lose 90% of your production in the first few years. So in order to keep the total flow of liquids from a shale oil play, you have to keep wringing sponges, lots of sponges, and that is capital intensive. That takes a lot of activity. If you slow the rate of your new drilling, you slow the rate of your wringing of the sponges, the volume starts to plateau and taper off. This is what the Saudis see, and other OPEC countries see, as a quality of US production. So they say, if somebody needs to do some cutting, why should we introduce flexibility and cut our own supply when our American friends will have no choice but to slow their investment and slow their production if it's needed to balance the market. So this is the message that has sort of gone out 
recently uh, into the U.S. And the, and the global oil sector. This is a supply curve, again, from the International Energy Agency. And it shows, again, this is shale oil. This is where the Saudis see us, right there. We're a new, uh, high cost. And what this chart, again, doesn't show, we're a flexible supplier. In a way, the U.S. is being asked to rejoin OPEC, which we left, which we stopped doing in 1972. We're being forced back into OPEC, forced to provide that flexibility in supply that you normally don't see. Okay, um, again, uh, this is just a point, uh, to make the point that this idea is new, uh, and it has come as a shock. Um, I don't know how it is down here, but um, uh, Wall Street Journal and Goldman Sachs are considered to be very, very uh, credible, prominent thought leaders. And when they announce something or they say something, everyone believes it's true as if it came from God. And so in October 27th, Goldman said, we believe that OPEC will no longer uh, add as a, act as the final first mover uh, in, swing, in being a swing producer. And Wall Street Journal said, oh, the Saudis aren't going to swing, and everybody was caught by surprise. Now you allow me a, a shameless commercial for my company. We've been telling our clients for well over a year that Saudi wouldn't swing. But for the consensus view, this is brand new. And so now what we're trying to do is figure out, as the price falls, how quickly will shale oil decline? I think it's likely that OPEC has overestimated how quickly U.S. production will plateau and drop at lower prices. They tend to think we're going to go into the $80 range, and that will do the trick. Uh, as we talk with companies and gather more information, uh, it's becoming clear that while certainly some companies who haven't hedged, who are small, who are not in very productive assets, they will slow down at $85 or 80. Much of our production remains economical and will continue. And remember, the investors in Wall Street are going to be telling these companies, keep investing, keep investing. Hold on to those crews, hold on to those rigs, hold on to those leases. This oil dip is going to come back up. There's many people who believe Saudi Arabia and OPEC will still cut, and that'll save the day. So there will be resilience in the US sector to, to cutting. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that Saudi Arabia would never cut. I, I don't believe that. I think, though, prices would have to fall more quickly for them to implement big cuts, meaning maybe even to the $60 range. I don't think they want the price of oil to completely collapse. But I also think they are willing to tolerate lower prices for longer than many of us expect. Now, this issue is very important as we think about the next several years. Who knows what's going to happen this winter and next year? Maybe their economy will recover. Libya is having problems even this week. Libya could go offline and oil prices will go back to $100 and everybody will be happy. But let's talk about the next several years. The consensus view in the next several years is a little bit like what we've seen recently. That is that oil demand is going to be fairly small. GDP growth will be strong. People expect 4% GDP growth. And again, as I said earlier, because the consensus tends to be optimistic about the pace of efficiency gains, they think that even a strongly growing world will only need about 1 million barrels a day of supply to fuel, uh, fuel the economy. Now, if you believe that, and you tally up and you look at the other producers who are coming on, Brazil first and foremost among non-OPEC producers, uh, the United States and other countries. You quickly see that there's the world's likely to supply more oil than will be demanded, according to their forecasts. And so what the officials expect, and BP is another kind of leading forecaster expects, is that, again, sort of as we saw in the early 1980s, OPEC, Saudi Arabia, will have no choice but to cut their supply. They'll have to play the swing producer. Not because the world's going to have weak economic growth, that's not assumed. It's because the world's becoming very efficient and because supply growth from the U.S. and Brazil and other places will be strong. So what you see here, this is a projection of OPEC spare capacity by British Petroleum. And you see how it shoots up here. This is basically assuming that some producer in OPEC, and it's really going to be Saudi Arabia, is going to cut its supply by several million barrels a day. 
So I'll leave you, I guess, with my, our take on that. I disagree with this view in two ways. As I told you earlier, I don't believe de efficiency is growing that fast. So if the world grows at 4%, if we have a fast growing world, we're going to need 2 million barrels a day plus, the way I look at the market. So we're not going to have an oversupply of oil. I disagree there. But it's possible I'm wrong. God knows I've made mistakes. So let's assume that the world grows fast, but the leading analysts are correct, and that efficiency will grow so that demand for oil will, kind of be, will be weak. My second area of disagreement is I do not expect Saudi Arabia to swing. I do not expect Saudi Arabia to swing. I think they are reluctant to surrender market share to their competitors, especially in a world that's growing fast. If the economy is very weak or in a recession, as we saw in 2008, 2009, Saudi Arabia will cut. And as I mentioned earlier, if we get into a deep downturn in the coming months and oil prices go down to $60, I think Saudi Arabia would cut. So they will play the swing supplier role in an emergency. But in terms of being that swing producer in a healthy, normal market, I don't think they're willing to do that. That means if that's true, then we're not likely to see that floor under prices that people are expecting. And finally, because I see Saudi Arabia not investing in more production capacity, most of their investments are going into the refining sector, they're not investing enough to build that spare capacity buffer you need to keep prices stable. I think that's it. So the long and short of it is, um, I guess our view is the world can have healthy, strong GDP growth. China at 7, emerging market countries 7 to 10%, OECD at 3% plus. They can have that. Or the world can have stable oil prices, but in my view, not both. If we have the strong GDP growth, upward pressure on prices will resume. If we have the efficiency gains that we hope for, and demand for oil is really slow, I think we're in trouble because the oil price is likely to end up being a lot lower than we expect. Again, because I don't see OPEC being willing to impose a floor and being able to impose a ceiling. Which is why, in a way, I think we're heading back into a period where, again, assuming the world is growing, we're in a roller coaster. Back to the 1920s, back to the late 1800s that we talked about, where we have more of a boom-bust cycle in oil prices that will be a challenge for all producers and consumers uh, to deal with in the coming years. Finally, I want to start where I, or finish where I started. I do look forward to coming back to Brazil. We are really counting on you. Uh, we are looking for Brazil to be the largest non-OPEC uh, supplier in terms of supply growth in the coming decades. $90 billion of, it, of investment is expected. You're expected to add about 3.5 million barrels a day of supply, well more than the United States is expected to. We will need every drop if we get to that healthy 4% GDP rate. We really will. But the challenge is, is to invest in that if we're in a world where prices could be gyrating by more than we're, we're used to. So with that, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Edmar. And thank you, uh, the Center on Global Energy Policy, Jane, Jason Bordoff. The leader uh, has just arrived, and he's here. And he, I'm going to throw any tough questions I get at Jason. Um, but I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.